This video was sponsored by Brilliant.org. Sailing south through the maze of tropical islands across Malaysia and Indonesia will lead you to an invisible barrier between two worlds. What in reality is a relatively small distance is a huge gulf between two vastly different ecological regions. On one side are big cats and hoofed herbivores similar to most of the world, on the other are two-legged herbivores that hop through the trees, aggressive flightless birds the size of a man, and mammals that lay eggs. These tropical islands acting like stepping stones allowing creatures to leak out of the horn of a giant remote southern continent, Australia. About halfway through Indonesia, these unique animals just stop in their tracks, the nature between Europe and East Asia being more similar to each other than on the other side of this line. This was once explained by Australia containing ancient animals that were primitive and from another time that only managed to survive into the present due to its isolation. Although it is true that Australia's isolation has done a lot to shape its unique animals, Australia's biological history is in reality way more complicated than this. When animals or humans have crossed over in or out of Australia more recently, it has been through what is now modern day Indonesia. But most of the Australian creatures, especially the very famous ones, did not travel into Australia this way. Australia has a whole array of endemic reptiles, bugs and marine animal species that aren't found in any other part of the globe, but the single group of animals that are most thought of as Australia's are the marsupials. But they did not originate in Australia, nor did they come from Asia. They actually travelled here from the complete opposite direction. In the 1980s, scientists discovered the fossils of marsupials in Antarctica that predate any fossil discovered in Australia. This, along with a lot of other strong evidence, shows that marsupials made their way into Australia through Antarctica. The earliest fossil of a marsupial known to exist was named Delta Theridium that did not live in Australia, it lived in what would become the Gobi Desert in Mongolia around 80 million years ago, sharing a habitat with dinosaurs like Velociraptor. Marsupials after this could be found in various parts of the globe living alongside placental mammals. However, after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, they seem to have gone extinct everywhere apart from North America, and their fossils are not known from Australia at this time despite the majority of marsupial species now calling Australia home, and North America only containing one species, the Virginia opossum. Very shortly after the mass extinction event, marsupials migrated from North America to South America. South America wasn't connected to North America at this point in history, but they were still very close together, so they may have been able to reach the continents via islands. Marsupials thrived in South America, spreading across the continent and diversifying into different predatory niches from bear-sized to weasel-sized animals, some of them heavily specialising into their environments, like the sporacidons that even developed sabre teeth. Differing from Australia today, these marsupials shared South America with many different species of native placental mammal as well. The large marsupials have now got extinct in South America, however, although they are not as diverse as they used to be, or as diverse as marsupials are in Australia, South America is actually still a big marsupial stronghold, containing almost 30% of the world's species to this day. They are just usually small and out of sight, like the Monito del Monte, or the short-tailed opossum. Around 50 million years ago, the southern continents were much closer together, and Australia was actually attached to Antarctica, not becoming completely free until around 30 million years ago. Antarctica was further north, warmer, and more habitable to animals like marsupials, and Australia was further south, being wetter and more temperate on average. So at this time, marsupials must have crossed over from South America into Australia through Antarctica, before the continent moved apart and became isolated. So marsupials did not originate in Australia, but that doesn't mean that Australia was completely void of resident mammals when marsupials crossed over. And in fact, Australia does have an ancient lineage of mammals that have been here since the dinosaurs still roamed. The fossilised jaw of an ancient mammal has been discovered in New South Wales that is dated to around 100 million years ago. It was named Strepsodon, and the tooth was incredibly similar to those of modern day platypus. Platypus and echidnas are the only living members of the funny ancient egg-laying animals, the monotremes, and this fossil shows that they have a very long history in Australia, and most likely originated here. When Cerepsodon roamed Australia, the landscape couldn't have been any more different. Australia was so far south that what would become modern day Melbourne would have been inside the Antarctic Circle, and Australia and Antarctica just made up one continent. Global temperatures were much higher at this time, so it wouldn't have been anywhere near as cold as modern day Antarctica, 
However, there is some evidence that there may have been sea ice in the winter, and fossilized trees show that great conifer forests would have smothered most of the land. Large dinosaurs were the largest creatures on land, and the estuaries and waterways that Sterepsilon would have swam through contained giant 5 meter long amphibians. There are fossils of monotremes known from South America from around 60 million years ago, so it is thought that like marsupials, the monotremes probably used Antarctica as a bridge to cross continents as well, only the other way round, travelling from Australia into South America. However, these funny creatures have now gone extinct on every other continent, with just one species of platypus and four species of echidna being found across Australia and New Guinea. It has long been thought that marsupials were an intermediate stage between monotremes and placentals due to giving birth to extremely premature young, and just managed to survive into the present due to the isolation that Australia offered. This is partly true because more often than not, when there is an ecosystem invasion, the marsupials will usually be on the losing end. However, the idea that placental mammals are more evolved isn't really true. Marsupials and placentals definitely evolved from egg-laying ancestors, and placental mammals also evolved from animals that gave birth to premature young like marsupials do. However, that doesn't mean they haven't still made big adaptations. There is a group of mammals called the multituberculates that were very successful before the extinction of the dinosaurs, but went completely extinct around 35 million years ago, and they were very closely related to the common ancestor of marsupials and placentals. Because they had a very narrow pelvis, it is thought that they probably gave birth to very premature young, like marsupials although it isn't known if they had any kind of pouch system. One study looking to the skull in different stages of development in more primitive mammals like multituberculates compared with marsupials shows that marsupial skull development is actually very different and has changed a lot, like placentals. It's entirely possible that like how placental mammals adapted a placenta, the pouch system solves the issues that come with giving birth to very premature young. Marsupials have adapted plenty, they have just evolved a different way of solving this issue. Plus, there are some advantages to having a pouch. For example, marsupials rather horribly can ditch their young if in a desperate situation, whereas placentals have no way of doing this. Marsupials are also really diverse. As far as we know, they are descendants of one or maybe a handful of migration events from Antarctica, but now number over 200 species and there would have been more before the arrival of indigenous Australians and then Europeans. Marsupials have diversified into hundreds of niches to fill out Australia's diverse climates, and many of these marsupials have converged on the same designs as placental mammals in other parts of the world to adapt to the conditions. In fact, although Australia has some animals that are truly unique, like kangaroos, most marsupials have strikingly similar body shapes to animals that fill similar niches to them in other parts of the world. Sometimes the creatures have just adapted similar features from living in a similar way, but sometimes the animals have adapted to have almost indistinguishable skeletons. The Tasmanian tiger is so similar to the skull of a wolf that it is actually pretty difficult for someone who is not a paleontologist to tell the difference. Sometimes convergent evolution forces similar adaptations among vastly different animal groups, but when animals share a similar physiology, convergent evolution becomes even more likely. For instance, silk has evolved multiple times among different invertebrates, but never among vertebrates. This is because they have certain aspects of their biology that make developing silk production more likely, and this is the same with mammals. For a warm-blooded animal with fur and claws, the canine body shape is just highly effective, so it has evolved multiple times. Today, Australia is very geographically isolated, but in the past it was a lot closer to other continents like Antarctica. But in fact, around 140 million years ago, all of the southern continents, Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, and India, were all connected together in a giant supercontinent named Gondwana. There are certain animals that are distributed across the south, showing the relationship these continents used to have. Most famously are the ratites, or paleonaths, the giant and mostly flightless birds that are only found across the southern continents. It is easy to assume that the paleonaths all descended from one flightless ancestor on Gondwana, and then when the continents broke apart, it left a scattering of flightless bird species spread across the south. However, it didn't really play out like this, and the paleonaths actually have a very complicated evolution. For instance, DNA evidence shows that ostriches that are only found in Africa branched away from the rest of the ratites around 70 to 75 million years ago. But at this time, Africa had long since broken away from Gondwana so there would have been well over a thousand miles of ocean between it and any other continent by this point. So it is thought that many of the paleonaths were still able to fly up until much later, 
like some of them still do to this day. Because of this, they were still able to travel the shorter distances between the continents at the time and then evolved to be flightless on multiple occasions. You can learn more about ratite evolution in this video here. For some of the Paleonaths, however, they actually did evolve at a time where it would have been possible to have crossed over continents without having to fly, and this may have been the case in Australia. The Rhea, which is a flightless ratite that lives in South America, separated from the Australian ratites, the emus and cassowaries, around the same time as when the marsupials made their way into Australia through Antarctica, so it would have been possible for the ancestors of emus and cassowaries to have done the same. And Antarctica Seymour Island, where the marsupial fossil was discovered, there are also bird remains that have been identified as belonging to a ratite. Study of their DNA shows that cassowaries and emus last had a common ancestor around 25 million years ago, and around this time there are fossils of large flightless birds in Australia that shared features from both emus and cassowaries. They have been named emuaries, and are thought to be the common ancestor of both birds. 25 million years ago, Australia was moving northward, away from Antarctica and becoming hotter and more tropical in the north. It seems that the ancestors of emus adapted to the more arid and Mediterranean climates in the south, and cassowaries adapted to living in the wet rainforests in the north, giving rise to the two different genera of bird over time. So most of Australia's famous animals have come from continents on the other side of the world, which just adds to the mystery of why there is such a big difference between its closest neighbouring continent, Asia, or more specifically a line that divides Indonesia and all of the Malay archipelago with such a stark difference in biodiversity over a relatively small amount of ocean. This phenomenon is known as the Wallace Line, and was first observed as far back as Darwin's time by Alfred Russell Wallace. And although even back then he was able to work out some of the reasons animals were arranged the way they are, the explanation turned out to be quite complex and combined several more modern scientific discoveries that Wallace would not have been privy to. Over the last two to three million years, the Earth has gone through several glacial periods where colder temperatures locked up more seawater than today, lowering sea levels by over 100 meters, exposing much more continental shelf swiping up many more of the scattered tropical islands into large land masses. Indonesia became a large peninsula that has been named Sunda, and Australia, Tasmania and New Guinea joined up together into a large island that has been named Sahul, which explains certain common animals like monotremes, cassowaries and kangaroos being found between these islands. And many of the western islands into Malaysia and Indonesia have large animals like tigers, leopards and rhinos. Also, as the higher sea levels also made the gap between these continents shorter, a very small group of animals were able to travel over the narrow sea into Australia. Despite their appearance, the hopping mice found throughout Australia are not marsupials, and are actually rodents, distinct native Australian rodents that DNA evidence shows split from Asian rodents around 2 to 5 million years ago, which would have been the very start of the Ice Age, and long before the arrival of other non-native species of rodent like brown rats, that were introduced by humans. With the exception of bats and some marine mammals, these rodents would have been the first non-controversial placental mammals to make it to Australia since the extinction of the dinosaurs. Indigenous Australians sailed to Australia during a period of lower sea levels too, but on the last glacial period of the Ice Age, around 50 to 60,000 years ago. Although Australia and New Guinea are close to Asia today, it is actually a fairly recent occurrence, at least in geologic time. Australia has traversed an entire ocean, moving from Antarctica up to Asia in around 70 million years. To this day, Australia is still the fastest moving continent, shifting at about 7 centimetres a year. This has had two impacts on the wildlife in the region. One being that Australia and New Guinea have only been close enough to Indonesia for animals to cross between them for a relatively short amount of time. But also, the movement of the Indo-Australian tectonic plate against the Asian plate is creating islands that aren't very old either. Many Indonesian islands are actually recently formed volcanic islands that are surrounded by very deep water, so a lot of these islands were very recently colonised by animals. For instance, Komodo dragons actually originated in Australia, and only reached the islands of Komodo and Flores less than 1 million years ago, and then went extinct in Australia. The Australian animals have been more successful in colonising these intermediate islands, possibly due to these newer islands having drier climates, more reminiscent of Australia. Australia itself is the driest warm continent on Earth, but even Australian rainforests usually receive less rainfall than rainforests in Southeast Asia, so Australia's native species were more suited to the environments found here. 
During the Ice Age, when Australia was still part of Sahul, like everywhere else in the world at this time, Australia had its own large mammals, including powerful predators like Thylaca leo, the marsupial lion. However, Australia also was one of the last continents to still have reptilian apex predators as well, like the giant monitor lizard Megalania, and Quincana, a large crocodile that was more adapted to live out of the water. But by around 10,000 years ago, all of these large unique predators had gone extinct. However, today Australia still has an apex predator, one of the last arriving animals to the continent still considered native, the dingo. Dingoes are so capable of hunting native Australian wildlife, you would assume they had been here all along. But the oldest dingo remains in Australia are actually only 3,500 years old. DNA evidence shows dingoes are descendants of East Asian domesticated dogs. However, they have come from a very early offshoot around 8 to 12,000 years ago, much earlier in their domestication. However, once they made it to Australia, they became genetically distinct, evolving certain common traits shared by all dingoes. They only reproduce once a year, and they have more flexible hips and front paw joints. In the absence of Australia's large Ice Age era predators, the dingoes have assumed the role of the apex predator, and other animals have adapted to their presence. Their DNA suggests they came from one dispersal event around 5,000 years ago, but during this time, sea levels around Australia would have returned to their current levels, cutting land access to other islands like New Guinea. This makes how they got there a bit of a mystery, and to add to the mystery, dingoes have a close relative in New Guinea, called the New Guinea Singing Dog, that most likely split apart at a similar time to when dingoes arrived in Australia. The most likely explanation of how dingoes got to Australia is that they were introduced by seafaring humans. However, there are at least five different people groups in the area that could have brought them over. However, the most likely candidates are the Tolian people that were hunter-gatherers that lived on the island of Sulawesi before Austronesian farmers migrated into Indonesia. Archaeological finds show that they would have been technologically advanced enough to sail to Australia, and so could have brought their dogs over while exploring. So, although Australia does have some ancient residents that have survived there for tens of millions of years with little change, this is not the story behind most of its fauna. Australian animals are the product of a series of complex migrations coming from many different continents over millions of years, and then had to make unique adaptations to face the challenges on this sometimes harsh continent. So although it is true that Australia is fairly remote, throughout its history animals have always managed to find ways of getting here. Throughout the days we spend a lot of time waiting. Waiting for a train, waiting for a friend to arrive, or maybe waiting in a queue. One thing I have found that helps me put these small amounts of time to good use is to try and learn new things, new skills, which is made much easier with this video sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an interactive online learning platform filled with well-designed short courses on STEM subjects. With the spare few minutes you have here or there, you'll learn by doing. The courses are interactive with a hands-on problem-solving approach that lets you play with concepts that has been proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. These short courses are very convenient for busy people, but learning little and often actually has educational benefits as well, increasing the chances of retaining information. The course's subjects range from programming and probability to astrophysics. I particularly enjoy the courses on data analysis, which helps me break down scientific data to more visually intuitive graphs and diagrams, because the courses are designed to be perfect for learners of any level. Brilliant can help you with high school, university, in your career, or maybe purely just for personal growth. For access to all that Brilliant offers, go to brilliant.org forward slash mothlight for a 30 day free trial. Plus, there is currently 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you for watching, and a massive thank you goes to all my patrons for supporting the channel.